He was sitting in the back. It's a good way. It's a good way to scoop people up, uh, teachers up, like so they don't know your name. <laughs> it's like if you move around, because a lot of times you you know the name based on like where people sit in class. Um, does anyone have questions concerning their design document, which is due today, I think? Great. We're going to talk about three things today. I, I will probably get to all three of them, but we'll see how it goes. We're going to talk, first of all, about putting pages within a container, putting the, all the content of a page within a container. All right. We're then going to talk about um, floating, which is probably one of the trickiest topics concerning CSS. And then finally, we're going to talk about mobile, um, mobile web development, making your pages um, work in a mobile um, environment. So the first one is container. And a container is simply a element that wraps around the whole page. All right. That, that sort of is between the body and the rest of the page. And it's sometimes called a wrapper, it's sometimes called a container. Um, and let me go and make one of them and then we'll style it. Now, this, unlike the other things that we've done, uh, unlike the other examples that we've done, this requires me to change the HTML a bit. Yeah, I'm just moving files around right now. But yeah, we will at some point need the screen on. All right. Um, so I'm only going to do one of the pages, all right? But you'd need to make the change to all the pages. So I'm going to get rid of all but the index page, simply because I don't want to do, I don't want to have to make that change over and over again. And again, this points out that if you wanted to use this technique, you would you would try to do as much as possible in the template before you started cloning it, right? Because the CSS we can change. Um, in one place because we abstract the CSS and put it in a single file. Whereas the HTML lives in every single file. So therefore, if we're going to do something that changes the HTML, then we have to go back and, and make that change to every page that we've done. Um, uh, again, there are ways when you study server-side scripting to sort of make up for that. All right, So that you don't have to change every HTML page. But right now, we're stuck with having to change that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this guy up. And I'm going to put a div. With an ID of container. And if you see examples of designs, you know, you'll see the word container, you'll see wrapper. You'll see something along that line, something that indicates that this goes around everything. All right. And then I'm going to close the div down here. And initially, guess what? It's not really going to make any difference because we haven't done anything style-wise with it. So let me close out of this and view the page. And sure enough, it doesn't look that different from what we had last time. All right. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and make some changes to the CSS. And we'll look at, at some of the benefits that this offers. So I'm going to go in and edit the CSS. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this. This is one of the advantages of using a container div. We don't have to style 
each individual element. We can just sort of put some styles on the big block of things and that'll take care of a lot of the stuff that we want to do. So, let me go in and I will put pound sign container. Again, why pound sign container? Well, container's not a tag. Container's an ID. It's an ID for one of my divs. What's a div again? A div is uh, a, a generic container. It was one of the few containers that were available in HTML4. Um, HTML5 we inter uh, was introduced a whole bunch of other containers like section and nav and header and so on. Whereas div was a, a generic container, it's just something, think of it as a division or a piece of the page. In this case, it's a piece of the page that covers everything. All right. And I'm going to go and I'm going to say margin 0px auto. And what's that going to do? It's going to center it. I'll give it a width of 60%. And finally, I'm going to say a min width of 400 pixels. All right. I'm now going to go in and I'm going to put a background image on the page. So we had this tile the other day. So let me copy that tile into here. Again, that's in the same folder. So I'm going to say background. Why a background color and a background image? Well, if I'm not tiling the background image, this will be the background color for the rest of the page. So in other words, if I, if I only showed one of these images or tiled horizontally or tiled vertically, it would only, it would, uh, the background color would apply to the rest of the page. In this case also, if something were to happen in that, pay, in that file uh, wasn't out there on the server for whatever fluky reason, at least I know it's going to have a background color that I want. All right, let's take a look at this. And I don't expect it to look perfect, all right, because I haven't changed any of these other things. But let's go and take a look. All right. Well, and it certainly doesn't look perfect. Notice one thing it has is it has the flexibility of being resized and the position. Why is that? Because all that code is within the container. So I didn't have to do anything special for the margins of the other stuff because the block container takes care of all that for me. So I'm probably going to have to go in and change the background color of some of the things. And I could go into the container now and give it a background of white. Now it doesn't look too bad except for the fact that that is too wide. I could go and accommodate that by saying, um, let's see, let's make it a width of 200 pixels left, 200. All right. And I have a page that looks like that and it's flexible within certain parameters. Okay.
keep in mind that my goal isn't to show you every design possibility, every layout possibility. My, design, my, my goal is to show you sort of the main categories of strategies that people use in laying out their page. There was a very simplistic one that we started out with where we used fix layout, where we absolutely nailed down things into certain positions by saying top and left. All right. There was fixed, which is sort of related to that, except it doesn't scroll when the page scrolls. We then use relative, where we can position things relative to where the flow was otherwise going to put them. All right. And then lastly, we use this container div so that we can arrange things. Um, we can treat that as a block and um, just position the block and let the other things sort of fall into place inside the block. So you can mix and match these things and use them together and you can come up with all sorts of different designs. Question, yes? Um, keep in mind that, that questions like that um, almost are on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I, it's, it would be tough for me to give a general answer, but I can kind of give you some troubleshooting. First of all, make sure that you are following the, the rules correctly. In other words, run your pages through the validators. Run this HTML and CSS through the validator and see if, you, if it catches any errors. Because there's a way that it should work, all right, and uh, if you follow the rules, if you break the rules, though, of CSS or HTML, then all bets are off, and it's going to make it the way that it wants to. Uh, a lot depends on the version of the browsers you're using as well. So, for example, I know IE 8 and prior behaves far differently than later versions of IE. And there's, there's code in the book that talks about what you can do to fix those issues if you run into them. Um, so I know that's not much of an answer, all right, but it's probably the only one I can other than to say we can take a look in lab to see exactly what's going on. Sure. Well, the browsers look at what you what you say to look at. So if you say pixels, it will look at pixels. If you say percentages, it will look at percentages. All right. So it's not like the browser has a preference for one or the other. It, it uses which one you give. Now, again, what you described of a link appearing in, in way different places depending on how you did it, um, it's possible if you did not say, did you say position absolute or position relative? Well, the difference between fixed and absolute, um, fixed positions things at a certain point of the screen, and I'm sorry, absolute positions things at a certain point in the screen, like this is position absolute. So notice as I scroll the page, it scrolls off. That's absolute. In other words, absolute is in relation to the corner of the page. So if the corner of the page goes off the screen, the navigation is going to move as well. Fixed is in relation to the browser window itself. So if I say, in this case, it's fixed, notice as I scroll, the navigation stays in place. So that's fixed. 
is not based on the corner of the web page, it's based on the browser window. So fixed stays put when you scroll, absolute scrolls along with the page. That's, that's the difference between those two. Okay. So again, without seeing your specific case, um, it would be hard for me to judge. We can take a look at it in lab um, and, and, and try to get that answered. Um, the, the one thing I, I strongly encourage you to do with this along those lines is to, as you are doing this, do a little piece of HTML or, or do your HTML then apply a little piece of CSS test it across browsers. That way as soon as it goes wrong you can see what caused it to go wrong as opposed to doing like a big CSS file and then all of a sudden stuff's all over the place and, and you can't really tell you know why stuff is where it is positioned. So that's what's one suggestion that I would have with that. The other suggestion I would have is to um, um, use a validator to, to check to make sure you haven't broken any rules. Because if you break the rules, all bets are off. It's going to take its shot at what it thinks you wanted, but again, that's, you know, that's, that's definitely going to be sort of an error-prone situation. Other questions? One cool thing that has come, under, uh, uh, come into place with CSS3 CSS3 is sort of associated with HTML5, is you can make things transparent. So let's take a second to look at, and I have to confess I've done this, I haven't done this too many times, so I have to look it up each time. Let's try this. All right. There's a nice effect where notice that the background of that div is white, all right? Yet I set the opacity to 0.5 or 50%. So that is like see-through or transparent. An opacity of 1 is completely solid. An opacity of 0 is invisible. And an opacity of 0.5 is um, um, see-through like this. Where you can see that it's there, but you can also see the background image poking between it. So this is an effective tool if, for example, remember way, way back when when we talked about uh, background images, um, we talked about um, um, the difficulty that you get with background images of the text appearing up against them. That, that the text can appear against the background image and um, it can be hard to read. Uh, and one of the suggestions was is that you could fade the image to make it look sort of like a watermark. All right. Another option would be to put your text in boxes with the opacity set and then you can make it so you can sort of see the image peeking underneath it. Now that's not particularly impressive with the tile here but let's look for another image that we can use. Or not? Well, 
Why was weird? Let's look for trees. Wow, if Google isn't working, I might as well just go home. Now, I will say opacity is one of those properties that is really problematic in older browsers. Um, fortunately, usually, if you put opacity on it, and the browser doesn't understand opacity, it does absolutely nothing and just makes it solid, which isn't that horrible of a deal. So in other words, if I was viewing this on an old browser, instead of getting the see-through white background, I'd get a solid white black, uh, block background, which, eh, it's not what I hoped for, but it's not horrible either. So let's look for a picture of a tree, because I like trees, so I want trees on there. I'm going to go to advanced search and I'm going to look for a big picture of a tree. I don't want to do that. I want to go to images. Now I'll go to advanced search and I want a big picture and I want stuff that is licensed by a Creative Commons license. And I do a search and all of these I can use. Oh, I like this one. copy that so I can put it in my credits. Then here I'm going to go in and I'm going to say bodytree.jpg. And now when I view it, notice how I can see that I can see the picture behind there. Now the text is a little harder to read. All right. How do you think I how would I take care of that? Well, I'd change the opacity from 0.5, let's say, to 0.7. So I'd make it less see-through, more solid. All right. That's pretty easy to read on the screen, so we could go and, and go with something like that. All right, and in that way you sort of see the, the, the picture peeking underneath it, and you can do that with good effect, um, you know, um, given the right image and the right um, background opacity. All right, so that's, that's another solution for that. Questions on any of this? Yes. Um, all the big word. The question was: Is are all CS3 stuff not compatible with older browsers? With an old enough browser, yes, it won't be. But the question is: Is what supports what, and how do you know that? And and the other part is: What happens if a browser doesn't support something. If a browser doesn't support something, it typically ignores it. So in this case, if it didn't support opacity, um, it would just render this as a big white block, which wouldn't be horrible. It wouldn't be the, the nice appearance that we get here, but that. Um, let's, let's Google
forgot I can't Google in IE, apparently. Let me go and add this to my page. Be a good example. browser support for HTML5 page can I use? That's the site I wanted to. And what it does is it shows some of the properties, the new properties of that. And if you click on it, let's see, opacity. It shows you what browsers support it and what browsers don't support it. So the green is, is that it supports it pretty well. The kind of off green is that, well, it kind of does, <laughs> but kind of not. And if you would ever see like a red uh, or orange, I think, that means that it doesn't support it. Yeah, red means not supported. Green means supported. Red or orange, I can't tell what that is, means not supported. And that kind of olive green means partial support. So you can use this for any HTML5 or CSS3 um, thing. For example, there's an audio element where you can, you can play audio files. And again, it's not supported in IE8, not supported in Opera Mini, but it's supported everywhere else. Um, let's pick something else. HTML5 form features. We'll talk about forms maybe later this week. Again, those two doesn't support these it does. It's a tricky business trying to figure out what browsers to support when you're developing a web page. It helps if you know something about your audience. All right. If, for example, you know that you are dealing to a tech crowd, all right, like if your page is like a, a page that deals with technical issues or something along those lines, you can probably guess that they have more current browsers than if your page is just intended for the general public. All right. That being said, your job is to make your page work under any circumstances and really that is one of the most frustrating parts, one of the di most difficult parts of web development is making sure your page works across different platforms. Um, and therefore, again, we're, we haven't gotten to this yet, but with HTML forms, if your browser doesn't support HTML forms, there are things that you can do in JavaScript to make sure that you can't enter in an invalid date or something along those lines. Other questions? Next topic that we're going to talk about is the topic of floating. All right. Here we have a lovely can of Mountain Dew. Kickstart. I'm still waiting to be contacted about possible endorsement possibilities. So if you're out there, Mountain Dew people, I, I typically have one almost every class, and I speak highly of it. What shape is the Mountain Dew Kickstart at this moment in time? Yeah, the liquid inside. It's the shape of the can, right. So if I were to pour it into a bowl, what shape would it be? It would be the shape of the bowl. And if I were to pull it, pour it into a cylinder, like you have in science class, it would be the shape of the cylinder. And if I just dumped it on the floor, it would be uh, the shape of the floor. All right? That's a characteristic of a liquid. 
uh, liquids take the shape of their container. So, you know, this is this size, whether it's in this room or if I put it in there or whatever, put it in my backpack or whatever, is always going to be this size. Whereas liquids take the size and shape of their containers. And in CSS there are things called liquid layouts. And liquid layouts take the shape of their container. Now where is this, where do you think this is going to benefit us to have liquid layouts? Layouts, web layouts that take the shape of their container. How do you think that's going to be good for us? Okay, pardon me? Okay. All right. Don't anyone want to add to it? Yes. I, I'm not sure if this was is what I mean, but when you have different devices. Ah, th as ex that's exactly a large part of what I mean. I think that's what you were hinting at. Different devices. Different devices were where you get a major win with this. Because if I view a page on my web browser, on my computer, that is this wide across, you know, I might get a nice two column layout. Whereas if I view a page on my mobile device, which is this wide, or not, don't tell me I left it at home. I can't leave it at home. I'll be out of touch with humanity. Here we go. This big. Well, does it make sense for a web page to look the same here on this giant, this isn't particularly giant, there's even bigger monitors, right? I don't know if you've ever seen those, like are this big, you know. Does it make sense that a web page is gonna, should be laid out the same on a device like this uh, as a device like that? Of course it doesn't. Liquid layouts are always good because, again, the layouts take the shape of the container. So if you have a big giant monitor, you're taking advantage of it and you're seeing things displayed big and you're using up all that real estate that you have available. Whereas if you have a tiny little monitor, like on a tiny little laptop, or, or then it accommodates the shape of it. And with the advent of mobile devices, this has become even more critical. The notion of a liquid layout. All right, the fact that we can write CSS that takes into account the size of the screen and changes the layout based on the size of the screen. Now, we'll talk about a few different techniques for this. The first one deals with what is called floating elements. All right. If you can imagine if we had a news site, for example, We might have columns side by side, like in a newspaper, on a big monitor. All right? That may be how it looks on a big monitor. If we scale that down to a small mobile device, probably not a good layout for that. Right? The two column for a mobile device probably isn't good. All right. In general, mobile layouts tend to be simpler than layouts on a desktop computer or a laptop. Why? Well, it's, they're just smaller, right? So make them simpler. So what may work very effectively is a two-column layout. We might want to have instead on a mobile device as a one-column layout. And then there's just vertical scrolling to go between those. All right. So how can we do that? Well, again, a lot of different things that we could do and we'll talk about them. There's actually a course in mobile web development that is, is offered, I believe, in the fall. There's a good course to take that we, we look at all the different things that you can do 
to make your web pages work better on mobile devices than simply using the same web page on your mobile devices as on your desktop. But the first thing that we talk about in that class is what we're going to talk about today, and that's the notion of floating. We're going to use a technique called floating to see and get a sense of the container to know how we're going to position things. Floating works like this. Let's say I have two things on the page. And I'll, I'm going to go and actually, I'm going to actually going to create this example. All right. Let's say we have a block A and a block B. I can specify a width for block A. And I can specify it either in terms of pixels or percentages. We're going to keep things simple to start and talk about pixels. That way we don't have to do math and we can, we can just, you know, it should be straightforward. Let's say we make this have a width of 500 pixels. And we're going to float this to the left. Let's say B also has a width of 500 pixels. And we're also going to float it to the left. What does that mean? Here's what the browser is going to do. This is my window. This is my browser window. And let's say right now it is 1,100 pixels wide. All right. Now, in this example, I'm going to disregard border and padding. We'll assume all those are set to zero. Okay. The browser will first draw this guy. 500 pixels, and it shoves it as far to the left as possible. That's what float left means. Shove it to the left. The next one, the browser has a decision to make. It looks to see if there is enough available space to shove it alongside the first guy. I know this isn't drawn to scale, but it'd be more like this probably. In this case, A takes up 500, there's 600 pixels left, B takes up 500, so there's enough room to shove it to the left alongside of A. So if I had CSS code that looked like this, and I had two blocks that look like this, if the browser window was 1,100 pixels wide, they would fit side by side like that. Okay? Now, what happens if I start narrowing the browser window? I go from 1,100 to 1,050. Still fits, right? 500 and 500, and then there's 50 to spare. At some point, let's say at 950, there's no longer enough room to shove this alongside of this. So what does it do? It drops it down underneath it. All right? So if there's enough room, here's... here's Floating in a nutshell. If there's enough room to put it side by side, it will. If there isn't, it drops it below the, the previous one. So let's go and let's create this. Let's create this example. And in this case, I'm going to put my CSS on the same page as my HTML just because it'll be simpler and we can look at everything all at once.
we're going to start out with no CSS at all. I'm just going to put my two blocks up here. I'm not even going to put anything in them. Actually, I'll put something in them. I'll make them both the Greek text. So there's ID equals A. Here's ID equals B. With no style whatsoever, what's it going to be? They're going to be blocks stacked on top of each other. All right. Now, let's go and let's, let's put some style in for these. And I'll do pound sign A. Background blue. Again, there's our two blocks. Let's give them each a width of 500 pixels. All right, they're stacked up next to each other. Why is that? Well, again, because at this point, these are in the flow, right? I haven't done anything positioning-wise concerning these. I'm going to make it 400 instead because I'm not sure how wide this monitor is. All right. So they're stacked on top of each other because, again, I haven't put anything regarding their position. When you do not address a position, remember your page's appearance is based on the CSS you put in plus the defaults of the browser, where the default of the browser is to stack them vertically as blocks because paragraphs are block tags. So now if I go in and I put float left on both of these, it'll do just what I described Just what I described on the board. So there's float left. All right. There's enough room to put them side by side. So I don't know how wide the page is. I would guess it's probably right around 1,000 pixels. As I make it smaller, boom, 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 boom. Still fit, still fit, still fit, still fits. At some point, boom, it drops down below. So if we can imagine, if this is a desktop browser with a relatively wide screen, this is how the page is going to look, which yeah, looks pretty good, I mean, considering what it is. If we add a mobile device, the mobile device is going to look maybe more like that. 
in which case, yeah, that looks pretty good. There's actually a tool that you can use to emulate uh, mobile devices. Let me download it here if I'm allowed to. The Opera Mobile Emulator is a nice free tool. that you can use to sort of test out your designs to see how they'll look in a mobile device. Now resizing the window is a pretty good test too if, if, if that's what you want to do, but this is maybe a little bit more thorough. Never know how long 30 seconds is until you're in front of a group of people talking and it says it's going to take 30 seconds to finish downloading. It's not going to let me. All right. Never mind. We'll just, we'll cheat then and do this. Actually, I think under Chrome, there actually is mobile emulation anyhow. Maybe it's a Chrome extension. I don't see it here. But at any rate, we can take the lazy way and simply resize it. Now, that's a pretty simple concept in this case. All right. Remember that the margin and the border and all that gets added on to it. All right. So if I have a margin on one of them, Notice previously it fit, but now immediately it goes over like that. So even there, even though it fits, it still fits, boom, it pops down below because when you add the margin into it, it doesn't fit anymore. All right. Now, you can get more involved with this by doing percentages. Now, you might say to yourself, if I make this, 50% and I make this 50% shouldn't it always fit? No. Why not? Why won't these fit? Takes 100% of the screen, that's fine. The screen has 100%. Does it take 100% of the screen? Yes. A good thought, but not necessarily. What is the monkey wrench in here? The monkey wrench in here is a margin of 20 pixels. If I say this takes up 50% of the screen, it takes up 50% of the screen. But it doesn't take up 50% of the screen. It takes up 50% of the screen plus the two margins. 
So this, if my calculation is right, would actually take up 50, uh, the, the two together would take up 50% of the screen, or would take up 100% of the screen plus 60 pixels. How did I come up with 60 pixels? Came up with 60 pixels this way. Twenty pixel margin, fifty percent. Twenty pixel margin, fifty percent. Twenty pixel margin. So it's one hundred percent of the screen plus sixty pixels. Why not forty pixels between them? Again, because of the margin collapse. It doesn't add margins together, it just makes sure that that amount of space is there between it. And if it is, it doesn't need to add it between it. So, 100% plus 60 pixels does not fit in the window, and therefore it will, by definition, drop it below. So if I view this, it doesn't matter how big the window is, it is not going to fit. I can maximize the window, I can make it small, doesn't matter. Why? Because those extra 60 pixels of margin prevent it from being able to fit side by side. Now, what about 45%? Oops, or let's do 40%. Now it's going to be now, now we have a math problem on our hands, all right? If Charlie leaves Chicago going west at, no, not that kind, well, similar to that kind of math problem, but now what's the total width, width going to be? It's going to be 80% of the width plus 60 pixels. If that is less than 100% of the screen, it will fit in. So in other words, what this is saying is, that if 60 pixels is less than 20% of the screen, it will fit in. All right? So let's look. Fit side by side. Fit side by side. And at that point, 20% of the screen is less than 60 pixels. So it can't fit that in and it drops them below. Now, we can really throw a monkey wrench in these things by throwing in a minimum width. All right? So I could say, for example, the minimum width of this guy is 200 pixels. And maybe the minimum width of this guy is 200 pixels as well. What it will do then is at a certain point it will stop resizing it. I think you can see how this is moving in, in a, a format um, that is a, quote, liquid layout. In other words, the layout matches the shape of the container, all right, to a point. And what we have is we have a case where if we're on a big, wide monitor, we get a two-column look. If we get to a certain size, like a mobile device, we get a nice one column look. So you can see already by using these floating, um, using the floating uh, method, we are um, 
moving in the direction of having a layout that works both in um, a larger monitor and in a mobile device. Questions about this? Yes. Uh huh. Right. Well, that could be done. That could be done a couple different ways. It could be done by absolute positioning and absolute sizes. For example, if I were to say, if I were to say my web page is 600 pixels wide, it doesn't matter how big the monitor is. The monitor could cover the wall. It's going to be 600 pixels. You know, and it's going to look. If it's a giant monitor, it's going to look like a little postage stamp uh, in there, or just take up part of the page. If, however, I do it based on percentages, then it will expand to take the available space. So, yeah, it could be done with minimum widths. It could be done with with absolute sizes, absolute widths of the the things. Yes. Yes. The, the question was, could we do things that says, l let me try to summarize your question and, and tell me if it's correct uh, or not. The question is, is can we create different style sheets or different styles that apply in different situations? In other words, a style sheet for the desktop device, a style sheet for the mobile device. And the answer is, Drum roll, please. Yes, we can. There's a couple techniques we can use to do that. The most simple technique is called a media query. All right? A media query is where you specify the rules under which a style sheet applies. So you say, if the window is this many pixels wide, use this style sheet. If the window is this many pixels wide, use that style sheet. So, um, in a nutshell, yes. There's also things that you can do JavaScript-wise, where you look at the kind of device that's being used and do different things based on the kind of device. There's also things that you can do via server-side coding that looks at the device and, and tells. Again, th this, these are all, we'll, we'll hit on some of these topics uh, in this class, but this is all the stuff that the mobile web development class um, um, addresses. For example, just something like a phone number. All right. If any of you have ever been on a mobile site, uh, on, you know, on a mobile device where you, like, let's say you, you look up a restaurant and there's a phone number there. All right. If you press the phone number, it can actually call that phone number. All right. And sites that do that are smart enough to know that you're on a phone, that you're not on a desktop browser. And therefore, you're able to, you know, those numbers, 440-555-1212, are actually a telephone number. And therefore, if you press them, tell your phone to call that number. All right? So a lot of cool things that you can do if you know a little bit about the kind of device that's browsing it. And there's any number of techniques that you can use to do that. Other questions? All right, now that we have this in place, let's go and let's actually make a full version of our little mini site using the floating technique. And the one thing that I hope you see in doing this is the relative simplicity of these techniques. In other words, thinking about if something were to change, how would you change it? And I think you'll see that actually by using float, even though the concept's a little confusing, by using float, it's pretty easy to set up and therefore to change as compared to using the absolute positioning where you have to actually know the number of pixels and stuff like that. So let's go and let's copy this.
All right. I'm going to go here, and I'm going to get rid of the CSS, or most of the CSS. And talk about what we need to do. All right. I have this right now. This is just, I have not done anything with the layout. I took out all the code that has anything to do with the layout. All right. So these are just blocks stacked on each other. Let's say. I want to make the page look like this. And why I want to do it via floating. What do you suppose I need to change in the CSS to make this work? That's how the page looks now. I want it to look like this and I only want to use floating to do that. How wide is the header going to be? Pardon me? 100%. Cover, cover the whole width of the screen. All right? That way that will put it there. And I know that if I float this and this, that's already at 100%. I can't put this guy here and here. What about these two? What percentages could I make them? Twenty eighty, twenty five seventy five, or maybe something like twenty seventy, just to take into account the little extra space of, with margin and all that. And then finally, what will I make this? Hundred percent. So should be able to do this fairly straightforward. Notice I said should be able to. So let's go and take a look at this. See what I got here. All right, header with hundred percent float left. nav with yeah, 20% float left Section sixty percent float left. <coughs> okay, something isn't right. Pardon me? I have nav in there twice. Okay, that's one thing that's wrong. Section footer. Alright, there we go. Alright, that's more or less the layout that I wanted. Header goes all the way across. Navs here, sections here footers on the bottom. Now, if I don't like these two things so close, what can I do? Margin, right, good. Margin is a space between things. So I can say margin, 
and I could say margin left because I just want to change the margin to the left of this. Um, you know, 10 pixels. And I actually mean the other left. space in between them. All right. Um, again, as far as troubleshooting goes, this is a lot of where I will put, make things different colors or put borders around them or things like that just to see um, how things uh, are working. One other thing you can do associated with floating is let's say I don't have a style rule for footer. Or let's say I don't have a width for footer. It's going to put that alongside of there. Now, I could easily fix that by saying a width of 100%. The other thing I could do is say clear both. Clear both simply says, like, stop the floating, start with the flow again. And that puts it down there as well. Now, run into a problem with this. And that is that as we make this go, that overlaps that. Why is that? Well, because I have some hard-coded widths in here. Let's get rid of the width here. there it works a little better. You can run into problems. The question was about mixing and matching and again I guess it depends what you mean by mixing and matching. You can run into problems if you're floating things and assigning widths to them. Because like as you can see here if you assign widths um, inside of that um, is going to sort of distort the, the width of um, the container. So one thing I could do is I could make a minimum width on the nav something like 150 pixels and that should get rid of my original problem because I've made each individual link 130 wide. That almost does. Just give it a little more margin and I'll bet we're okay. Now, at a certain point, when it gets really small, it pops it down below. And again, if you think about it, that might not actually be a bad thing if you consider that they could be on a mobile device. There's jokingly names for these layouts called liquid. Um, sort of the container one that I, example I used before, sometimes it's jokingly called jello because there's a little bit of give to it, but it doesn't completely conform to the size of the container. 
Now that being said, we should test this on other browsers. We tested this on Internet Explorer. We should go in and test it on other browsers. So let me go in and open this with Firefox. And behaves the same. Open it with Chrome. And it behaves the same. The other thing we would want to do, and we probably should have done this before, in fact we might have done this last time, I don't remember, is going into the validator. to make sure that our code is compliant. So I'll go into the HTML validator and I will paste the HTML code in. That's not, no, this is not the right page. And this was successfully checked as HTML5, so I haven't broken any rules. <coughs> Excuse me, I have some warnings that I could take a look at. Give me a warning. If you, it's give me a warning on that H1 that is part of the section. Um, depending on who you ask, either this should be an H1 because it's the top level heading in that section or other people would make that an H3 because it's a, it's a third level on the page but I prefer to do it as an H1 because that logically makes more sense to me. Um, you could also validate the CSS by going to the CSS validator. and no errors found. Congratulations. Questions over any of this? Yes? Ah. Yes, that's a good observation. But let's, let's find out why that really is. These are stacked vertically. Let's look at the CSS. LI is displayed as inline. The A is defined as inline block. So yes, they are inline, but they're stacked vertically. Now the question is, is why are they stacked vertically? They're stacked vertically because the nav is narrow. All right? The nav is only taking up 20%. So therefore, it can't fit them all alongside of each other. It drops them down below. Now... Sort of proof of that is if I make that 100%, let's say I change the layout a little bit, and I want the navigation to be oriented horizontally. If I make the nav 100% width, then there's 
they're stacked horizontally because now there's enough room to put them side by side whereas before there wasn't enough room. But notice how, how seamless it is and how straightforward it is to go and change that. By simply changing some percentages, we can take um, a site that was oriented that way and change the layout that way. So it's very, very, very flexible um, to do that. Other questions? What is different in surfing a website on a mobile device versus surfing a website on a desktop browser or laptop browser. We've already identified one obvious thing. The screen is going to be smaller. All right? Is that the only difference? Go ahead. Pardon me? The text could be bigger. All right? Could be harder to read, so you'd make the text bigger. Um, or, or what you're, you're saying is on a desktop, the text is likely to be bigger. Or on a mobile device. Okay. The question was the differences between a desktop and a mobile device. And you're saying the text... Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, getting back to, to your statement, I, I think what you're saying is, is that one difference is the text could be harder to read on a mobile device, so you better make it bigger. Okay. Right. So it usually is. To your point, um, sometimes the navigation is not always present. All right. In other words, sometimes there'll be icons that you'll click on, and when you click on that, the navigation spreads out and you can do that. Again, that's a consequence. Uh, both those are consequences of having less real estate to deal with, less space on the screen to deal with. Is there anything else that's different about surfing a site on a mobile device versus on a desktop? What is your? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, you can you can change the entire shape of of the of the container by turning it on its side. You could kind of do that with this. I can make it tall and thin, so that's similar to to that. What are other differences? What about your um, what what is likely to be true about your connection to the internet? Yeah, it's probably not going to be as fast as with a desktop device. What about the power of your hardware compared to a desktop device? Pardon me? Depends on the desktop and depends on the mobile device, right. But as a general rule, it's likely to be not as powerful. You're, you're right. I mean, some of those phones are amazing now, you know. But... If we're going to make a generalization, chances are your, your power is going to be, your, your, your hardware is going to be less powerful than that. What about how you would use it? Forget about the technical and the physical things. Let's say we're talking about Lorraine Community College's website. If you accessed it from a mobile device, are you likely interested in the same things than if you accessed it from a desktop device? In other words, are you going to use a mobile device to schedule your classes? Yeah, I probably wouldn't. All right. What kinds of things might you look up on a mobile device on LC's website? An address. Yeah, phone number. All right. I need to contact my professor. What's, what's the phone number? What's the email address? Now, we probably aren't going to think about this during summer term, but when I give this lecture during winter term or fall term, the question becomes, do we have a snow day today? 
Alright? That's something you might want to look up. I guess my point is, is that in addition to the hardware limitations, because there's some hardware limitations, you interact with a mobile device differently than you interact with a desktop. You know, you actually touch the screen as opposed to using a mouse. Use a virtual keyboard instead of a, uh, typically you use a virtual keyboard instead of a, a physical keyboard. But beyond that, you're likely to be looking for different things on a mobile website. Now that's not true all the time. You know, in the case of say a simpler website, like for a restaurant, chances are you're going to be browsing your mobile device for the same things that you would uh, on a desktop. You know, directions to the place, what hours are they open, you know, maybe a sampling of their menu or something along those lines. All right? But for more complex websites, you're probably going to interact in a different way in that you're probably looking for short answers to questions instead of long, lengthy browser uh, settings. So, for example, if you're planning a career and trying to decide what major to take, you're not likely to do that on the phone. You're likely to want to do that either on your laptop or a desktop. But if you wanted to look up a phone number, you're liable to do that uh, on there. As a general rule, all right, all these things point to mobile websites being simpler and more straightforward as compared to their desktop equivalents. Now, there's a number of strategies that you can take with a mobile website. And depending on the nature of your problem, each one could be appropriate. One method is to make a one-size-fits-all. In other words, make a website that looks good both in a mobile environment and a desktop environment. You'll likely use floating and things like techniques that we talked about today to accomplish that. And that's possible to do if you have a simple website. If you have a simple website. Second thing you might do is you might take the same website and style it differently for a desktop versus a mobile. So a lot of things you can do with styling all right, that we haven't even talked about yet. For example, you can hide things. All right. If, for example, one paragraph is not really necessarily and you wanted to simplify um, it, in a mobile environment, you could create a style sheet that's used for mobile devices that hides that paragraph. All right? And, there, and therefore the, 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 the page wouldn't be cluttered with extra stuff. All right? The last thing that you can do is you can say, hey, look, my mobile users are so different than my desktop users that I'm going to make a separate site for mobile users versus desktop users. How many of you use the web a lot on your mobile device? Have you ever noticed when you go to a site, if you go to like CNN.com, for example, you'll notice that the URL actually changes to something like m.cnn.com instead of www.cnn.com. You're actually sent to a mobile version of the site. So there's a full range of strategies you can take um, as far as making your website work in a mobile environment. You can have a one-size-fits-all strategy, which can work in the case of a simple website. You can have the same website that you simply style differently. And then lastly, you can have two separate websites and simply have a traffic cop on your web server that directs people. All right, you're on a desktop device, go here. You're on a mobile device, go here. All right. Um, we're going to talk about the second option next time where we have one web page, but we style it differently depending on, um, depending on whether it's a mobile device or a desktop device. The other strategies, the one size fits all, really there's not much to say except do a good job with your CSS and it'll work. The 
multiple websites. That's a topic that we'll talk that, that we talk about in the mobile web development class. Any questions at this point? All right, we'll see you down in lab.